Hello, everybody. This is Brother Billy McDougal. You know, I go by Billy Mac, and we just want to welcome you to He's Not Done Yet. And we're just going to go ahead and start out with prayer this morning. And uh, if you do have a prayer request, we would love for you to, to either call it in or text it. You could text it to 501-339-8017. That's 501 501- Three three nine eight zero one seven. Lord, we love you. We just praise you today, God. We thank you for this opportunity, God. We just uh, we're throwing seed out today, God, and we just pray that it fall on good ground, Lord. And we're so honored, Lord, and we're so thankful. And we thank you for this day, Lord. And we we love you, and we pray it in the name of Jesus. This morning, scripture comes from Second Corinthians nine and seven. Every man according to his purpose in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Y'all worship with us this morning. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around is shaken. I've never been more glad, I put my faith in Jesus, he's never let me down, faithful through generations so why would he fail now
matter what it looks like I'm gonna stand on you Rain came, winds blew My house was built on you I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through Rain Enjoy that, and uh, we're just so honored and uh, really enjoyed that from Brother Fish. And uh, he's been in uh, revival at our church. We're over 180 people going down in the name of Jesus, and we're celebrating it. We're still in revival going on three and a half months, and uh, we're so excited. And today we're, we're going to have a special guest, a really close friend of mine, somebody that I dearly love and, and um, respect uh, highly, and uh, we're, we're going to have him come and obey the Holy Ghost, and Brother Davis, you just go ahead and come on, and uh, we, we want to hear from the Lord this morning. All right. Well, glad to be here, Brother Billy, and uh, 
uh, we're excited about this going out, and we prayed this morning that, that God would, his perfect timing, that this would uh, uh, be accessible to someone, that they would come to truth. And uh, uh, I have some preliminary remarks I'd like to make. First of all, uh, I'm not going to be able to cover all this subject today, not even close to it. And also, uh, we welcome you to call in at 501-339-8017 for questions. Also, I want to let you know today we're not here to bash other people's religion or make judgments calls on whether people go to heaven or to hell. But we are here to give you the light of the gospel, of the scripture. For an example, in 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has let it shine in our hearts that we could come to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1 and 7 says, The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those that know not God and that have not obeyed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? Think about people that know God, but yet they have not obeyed the gospel that's people that's got the baptism of the Holy Ghost in different places around the world. And the Lord has let that Holy Spirit inside them lead and guide them until they hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is repentance, baptism in Jesus' name and being filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, first thing we're going to talk about in just a few minutes today is uh, uh, the difference between monotheism and polytheism. The doctrine of monotheism is the doctrine or belief that there's only one God. Polytheism is, of course, the doctrine or belief in more than one God or many gods. But we're going to go to the scripture again. We're going to give you a scripture on the invisible God. 1 Timothy 1.17, Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. John 1.18, no man has seen God at any time. John 4, 24 said, God is a spirit. And there's only one spirit. Uh, so if there's only one spirit, there's only one God. And 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. So there's only one spirit of God. There's not two spirits of God. The Holy Spirit is God's spirit. The only, one, the only one God in Isaiah 44 and 6, uh, are you listening? Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Isaiah 44 and 8, fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. This God that's invisible, he's very emphatic. He said there's only one God. Isaiah 44, 24 says, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things and stretch forth the heavens alone and spread abroad the earth by myself. i got a question here. Can you be alone and be by yourself and have somebody with you? That's pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? So Isaiah 43 and 10 and 11 says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. The God of the Old Testament, the Jehovah, of the Old Testament said, Beside me, there is no Savior. So we open up into the book of the New Testament, and we find in Luke 2 and 10, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So here's God speaking again in the New Testament or in the Old Testament in Isaiah. He said, beside me there is no Savior. And in the New Testament, the angel declared in the city of David, 
There's a Savior called Christ the Lord. When you understand, He's both of them. He's the Christ of the New Testament, and He's the Lord God of the Old Testament. Hebrews 10 and 5 says, Wherefore, when He cometh into the world, He saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. So the angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy unto all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Hebrews 10 and 5 says, Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. God prepared himself a body. Oh, yes, it's true. First Timothy 3, 3, 16, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of the angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on the world, and received up in the glory. So it says God was manifested in the flesh. Don't you think it's strange that there's a, not a dialogue? There's no conversation between the Father and the Son in the Old Testament. Have you ever thought about that? The Trinitarians actually have to start in the New Testament and work their way back to the Old Testament because there was no conversation between the Father and the Son in the Old Testament. So the Bible said we to rightly divide the word of truth. Going from the Old Testament back to the New Testament is not rightly dividing the word of truth. So uh, these people who actually teach this doctrine They'll tell you there is a conversation between the Father and the Son. We're going to go there right now and explain. In Genesis 1.26, God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over the cattle and all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female, created him them. So here is where they say there's a dialogue between the Father and the Son. But let's examine it a little bit closer. And God said, let us make man in our images. Those are plural pronouns, mean more than one. More than one what? Isaiah said, there wasn't no God beside me. I know not any. And he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, okay? So if there's a verse 26, there must be a verse 27, and there is a verse 27. The verse 27, so God created man, God singular, created man singular, in his own image, singular, in the image of God, singular, created he, singular, him, them, male and female, created singular, he, them. So when you understand the scripture, because you have to have the scripture to interpret the scripture. If you interpret the scripture any other way than with the scripture, you get false doctrine. Romans 4, 17 says, he calls those things that be not as though they were. In Romans 5, 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned at the, the similitude of Adam's transgression. What's this? Who is the figure of him that was to come? Adam was made in the figure of him that was to come. Jesus Christ, as the person, was not with God in the beginning. The scripture here said he was made in the figure of him that was to come. Speaking of the enfleshment 4,000 years before it ever took place because God speaks of things that be not as though they were. God is not a man. He's not trapped in time, space, and matter like you and I. So he can speak on a subject 4,000 years before it happens as though it's already take, taken place. And the only thing that makes any sense at all is that God was manifested in the flesh. So here you have the answer to this question. God speaking of things that be not as though they were, and Adam was made in the figure of him that was to come. 
The son, ladies and gentlemen, did not take place until Bethlehem. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What was with God in the beginning? His Word was. This Word is a Greek word called logos. The word logos means the plans and the thoughts of God. God had the plans and the thoughts 4,000 years before Jesus Christ ever came on the scene. Who was Jesus? He was the Logos or the Word of God made flesh. Okay? So, there's questions. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with a few questions here real quick. Uh, is the Scripture, we, we need to stick with the Scripture. Is he God the Son? Or is he the son of God? Is he the eternal son, like some of these preachers that you've heard talking about the eternal son? Or is he the begotten son? John 3.16 said he is the only begotten son. So, if you're eternal, you can't be begotten. Begotten means there was a time you didn't exist. The scripture said he is the only begotten son of of God. He's not the eternal God because if he's the eternal God, that means God the Son, which was eternal, died. There is no such thing as dead deity. He was not the eternal Son. He was the begotten Son. God is omnipotent, omniscient, and I'm not present. I'm just trying to stir your little memory up and get you to thinking with me the Bible said the Father sent the Son. Now, if there's a trinity or there's more than one person in the Godhead, see, you got to understand John 4, 24, God is a spirit. He is omnipresent. He, he, he don't come up on a situation and say, what's going on here? He's already there, okay? He's omnipresent. If you got three persons in the Godhead, that means that God the Father is omnipresent, God the Son is on that present, and God the Holy Ghost is on that present. So immediately, the omnipresence of one eliminates the omnipresence of the other. Or the scripture said, the Father sent the Son. How can the Father send the Son somewhere he's not already at? Think about it a minute, okay? John 3, 16, so God so loved the world. Now, this is a question that's going to really kind of Stir your thinking, okay? John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So God the Father is the father of the son. Is that right? That's right, okay? Matthew 1, 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Matthew one twenty one, but while he thought in these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost. Luke one thirty five, and the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So we here we have the Holy Ghost overshadowing Mary. Here we have the scripture where it said that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now the, the birth of Jesus Christ says she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now is she the son is Jesus Christ the Son of of the Holy Ghost, the third person in the Trinity, or is Jesus Christ the Son of the Father, which is the first person in the Trinity? It can't be both. But the answer to the question is real simple. The Holy Ghost is God's Spirit. And the reason it's God's Spirit is because it's God's Spirit given to men. Okay? So, uh, we just... 
kind of give you this little bit of information just to prong your thinking. We're not trying to make you upset. We're not trying to make you mad. We're just wanting you to, 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 the Bible said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. These are they which testify of me, Jesus said. So you have to not, you can't have a superficial examination of the scripture. The Bible said he will reveal himself to you when you search for him with your whole heart. So get into the scripture if you really want to be saved. Jesus is getting ready to come back, and he's coming back, the Bible said, with flaming fire with vengeance on those that know not God and have not obeyed the gospel. So what we're going to do, we're going to give you some of the gospel right now. There is a plan of salvation. Now, if you look at a successful man or woman, you're looking at a man or, or a woman that's successful, they have a plan. Do you think that God would be any different? Do you think that he does not have a plan? And the Bible talks about he's not the author of confusion. So if any, any old way will do to be saved, then probably no way would do just as good. No, God has a plan of salvation. So the religious world, they want you to make a profession of faith. They want you to accept the Lord as your personal Savior. Uh, they want you to make a decision for Christ. Now, I'm not trying to be mean Billy Graham. He's already gone to his reward. But he would have thousands of peoples in stadiums and say, come down and make a decision for Christ. See, that's not in the Bible. People that adhered to that and came to that never did read their Bible because it's not in the Bible to make a decision for Christ. In fact, the scripture said, he has chosen you. You hadn't chosen him. Okay. So Jesus gives us the answer in John 3 and 5. And if you go to John 3 and 5, you'll see where Jesus was in a dialogue with a man named Nicodemus. And he told Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again of the water and of the spirit, or you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus said, I'm an old man. Can I enter the second time in my mother's womb? He said, Nicodemus. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. He said, marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeneth, and thou heareth the sound thereof, but canst not tell whether it cometh or whether it goeth, and so is every one that is born of the spirit. So he was saying, you've got to be born again of the water, and you got to be born again of the Spirit. That's a far cry from making a decision for Christ. So we're going to, I can't, like I told you earlier, I can't touch everything today. I can't uh, dot every I and cross every T. I'm only giving you a brief today. So if we're going to give you a brief of how to be saved, certainly we ought to go to the man that's got the keys to the kingdom, shouldn't we? So Jesus Christ was speaking to his disciples in Matthew 16. He said unto them, But whom do ye that I am? He said, who do, who do men say that I am? He said, Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should go, should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Okay? He was telling Simon Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And this key is who Jesus is. We just gave you several scripture of the Old Testament God said there was not another God beside him, and beside him there was no Savior. On the day uh, or in Bethlehem uh, of Judea, Jesus was born, and it says he was both Lord and he was Christ. So when Simon Peter was talking to Jesus, 
He said, thou art the Christ. And Jesus said, upon this rock of who he was, he's going to build his church. And he's given to Simon Peter the keys to the kingdom. Now, before we go to the keys to the kingdom, he addresses them one more time in Luke 24. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, Thus it behoove Christ should suffer, rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Now, there's people today that will tell you that the apostles, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all the apostles, 12 apostles, how that they were saved on the shores of Galilee walking with Jesus. That's not true. If you'll notice, Peter swore, he, he, he sweared, he cursed, and denied that he even knew Jesus. Judas sold him for 30 pieces of silver and went and hung himself. These don't sound like regenerated men to me. These don't sound like saved men to me. In fact, Jesus looked at Simon Peter, and he said, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But he said, I have prayed for you. He said, that your faith fail you not, and when thou art converted... Strengthen the brethren. He was not converted yet. Jesus is telling them to go back and wait for the promise of the Father. You got to go to Jerusalem. Okay? So we're going to Jerusalem. And if you, if you read Acts chapter 1, you'll find that all 12 of the apostles were there in Acts chapter 1. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. All you Catholic folks, listen up. Mary was in that upper room. And the Bible saying when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord and one place, and there appeared to them clothed in tongues, like as a fire, it set up on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Mary was there. All the 12 apostles, the Bible said 120 experienced this wonderful, glorious experience of being filled with God's Spirit. And when this took place that day, I can't cover all bases. I'm just going to give you a brief today. Therefore, let all the his, his house of Israel know assuringly that God hath made this same Jesus whom you have crucified. Now watch this. He's both Lord and Christ. He's humanity divinity. He's the Father in the Son. He's the Spirit in the flesh. He's both of them. Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father. The words that I speak, I speak not of myself, but the Father, listen to it, that dwelleth in me. God's a Spirit. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So here on the day of Pentecost, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter, now watch this, Peter's got the keys, remember? Peter's got the keys. They said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? The man with the keys stood up with the 11 apostles. He had apostolic certification standing beside him. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, if Luke, we mentioned to you just a minute ago in the book of Luke, where he said that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. So repentance, this is a, 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 a step a lot of people stumble over. That means you've got to die to your self-will. Repentance is symbolic of death. And the Bible said, And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, on the day of Pentecost, they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. 
In Acts chapter 2, they were baptized in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 8, they were baptized in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 10, they were baptized in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 19, they were baptized in Jesus' name. Nowhere in the New Testament was anyone ever baptized use the words Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I'm going to give you some history right now, and then we're going to go in to this name. Now, this is the historian speaking. You can go to your library and look these up in the encyclopedia. Now, let us look at the library on the history of the baptism. There was some smart guy come along, and he said the apostles were ignorant, unlearned men. So they tried to change it all up. But you can actually, you can refer to the Department of Information in Washington, D.C., what formula was used in the early church according to history. In the following references, books, it is plain what history teaches. Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition, volume 3, page 365-66. The baptismal formula was changed from the name of Jesus Christ to the words Father, Son, Holy Ghost by the Catholic Church in the 2nd century. Volume 3, page 82. Everywhere in the oldest sources, it is stated that baptism took place in the name of Jesus Christ. Canon, Catholic Encyclopedia uh, of Religion, early church always baptized in the name of Jesus Christ into the development of the Trinity doctrine in the 2nd century. Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 2, page 265. Here the Catholics acknowledge that baptism was changed by the Catholic Church. Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion, Volume 2, page 377. The Christian baptism was administered in the name of Jesus Christ. So we give you the history on this, but history is not how you're saved. You're saved by the Scripture. So Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So what is the singular name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Now, if I ask you to repeat my command and I say, go down to the store and get me a Coke, and you look at me and say, go down to the store and get me a Coke, did you obey my command or did you repeat my command? Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He didn't say repeat my command like the Catholic Church taught in the second century. He said, obey my command. So in Acts 2, 8, 10, and 19, they obeyed that command by being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father. John 5, 43, I've come in my Father's name. Hebrews 1 and 4 said he got his name by inheritance of the Father. The name of the Son, Matthew 1, 21, the angel said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, 26, talking about the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. So the Father was in Jesus' name. The Son was in Jesus' name. The Holy Ghost was in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 2, they baptized in Jesus' name. Acts 8, Acts 10, and Acts 19. They always baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture, not just there, but in Romans 4 and 12, says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given among men, whereby we must be saved. Colossians 2, 9 said, He is given a name that is above every name. Now, let me ask you a question, dear friend. If you were going to get baptized, wouldn't you want to get baptized in the name above every name? You wouldn't want to be baptized in an inferior name, would you? So Jesus is the name that is above every name. So when you repent of your sins and you're baptized in Jesus' name, you're promised the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, if you want to get the Holy Ghost, you want to get it like they got it in Acts chapter 2. The Bible said they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God give the utterance. This is the Jews in chapter 2 in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10, the Bible said that Peter went down to Cornelius' house, the Gentiles, and the Bible said while he spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them 
which heard the word. And as many as come with Peter were astonished because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now watch it. And Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, friend, baptism is not an option. It's a commandment. It's not one of the ten suggestions. It's a commandment. Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, Acts chapter 19, the Bible said that Paul was passing the upper coast. He ran into certain disciples of John the Baptist. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? The Baptist said, we haven't even heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Well, he said, well, how were you baptized? He said, we were baptized under John's baptism. Paul told him, said, whoop, you got to do it again. This time, he said, uh, we hadn't even heard whether there'd be any Holy Ghost. Well, how were you baptized? We were baptized under John's baptism. Well, John merely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto them that come after him, even on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look for yourself. It's right there in Acts chapter 19. And the Bible said when Paul laid his hands on them, they got the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues, just like in Acts 2, just like in Acts 10. And it happens again to the followers of John the Baptist in Acts chapter 19. Of course, this, this baptism of the Holy Ghost is the greatest miracle that ever took place. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, when you get born again of the water and of the Spirit, you don't think, well, I'm, I think I might have got saved. I, I think I got saved. No, there is a life-changing experience called the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. If you go to the, like I said, I can't cover all bases, go, go to the book of James chapter 3 and read about the tongue. It's the most unruly member of your body. It's no surprise to me that God, when he comes in with his spirit, takes a hold of the most unruly member you have, your tongue, and begin to speak through you in a Holy Ghost language. So this great miracle of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Bible said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Many, many years ago, I was in jail. I was on drugs. I used a needle. I wasn't a weekend warrior. I was a dope addict. And when God uh, locked me up in a jail to save me, and these wonderful apostolic people came to this jail where I was at, I listened to them testify and sing for nine months. And I thought, whew, I don't know what I'm going to do. But finally, I talked to the captain of the jail. He let me out for a weekend, Brother Billy. I went to church, and I repented. I got baptized in Jesus' name. God filled me with the Holy Ghost, and I began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. It changed my life completely. I had to be at jail the next morning at 6 o'clock. But there wasn't no more marble smoking. It was broken. There wasn't no more drug addiction. It was broken. I didn't have to go to a rehab center. I didn't have to do no methadone clinic. Didn't have to do any of those things. But the Bible said if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The things you used to hate, now you love. Now the things you used to love, now you hate. He changes your life completely when you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Just to give you a brief and I'm going to finish in the next couple of minutes, I hope. But when I was a drug addict, I let somebody put a needle in my arm at 19. It gave me hepatitis C. Forty years later, 40 years later, I'm laying on my deathbed. Hepatitis C it turned into liver failure. I went from 210 pounds to 118. I'm two days from death, and the reason I know this is they were going to have to draw the fluids off of my body again. And the last time they did, it almost killed me. So here I am laying up in the hospital bed. It's either get a liver transplant or die. Either that or God give me a miracle. 
Well, God decided to take me the long way around because he wanted to get some things out of me and put some things in me. So here I am. I'm laying in that hospital bed on Friday the 13th. And at 9 o'clock at night, three doctors come partying, slapping one another, jumping around. And I said, what in the world is going on? Two men and a lady. And the woman doctor said, we got a liver for you, and we're going to give it to you at 6 o'clock in the morning. Can you imagine what God has to do to get you a liver? Well, he did it for me. So I'm glad to be on this broadcast today, and uh, maybe later on we'll be able to do it again. So please consider what we've said today. We don't say any of this with malice, strife, or division. We're not trying to attack your religion, but we are saying, hey, there's a lot more to it if you'll seek after it. God bless you. Thank you so much, Brother Davis. And we want to thank you. And what a word we've heard today. I just want to thank you, Lord. And uh, we just uh, we just want to let you listen to this song on the way out. In the name of its worth. You thought I was worth saving. So you came and changed my life.
glory to the God who changed my life and I will praise you forever forever and ever come on sing it sacrifice your life so I could be free. 